but that's like the one where the guy comes up on the wreck and they, then about an hour later the state police shows up and says, what happened? He says, well, they had a wreck over here and there's four environmentalists in that car. He says, well, where are they at? He said, I buried them. He said, why'd you bury them? He said, well, they were dead. He said, you sure? He said, well, two of them said they weren't, but you know how them environmentalists lie. That's kind of jokes that are going around now. Gonna buy some wood Every size and length I'm Gonna build it good Using all my strength Gonna clear the land Where the house will be Start another branch Of the family tree Gonna chalk a line uh, we moved over here to Mill City from Willamina. Things got kind of slow over there and wasn't much going on, so we moved over here looking for a job. Been time that I wish I'd have done something else, but and and over the years I have did other jobs, but I seem to always come back to trucking. I kind of like I like driving, just about anything, you know. Really, I guess if I had my uh, my dream or whatever, I'd probably be a race car driver. <laughs> I like race cars. they're trying to protect if we don't know how long we're going to have our jobs. I'm sure there's going to be quite a few of us who lose our jobs, but we don't know who they'll be. I know it gets kind of depressing at times, worrying, you know, when you have to, you know, be scared for your job. I'm not worried so much about myself as, as I am for my kids and my grandkids. You know, what are they going to do? You can catch all of them on fire. You didn't burn your I can't have birthday cakes anymore. There's so many candles it flames out. <laughs> Burns the room. One more and you got it. Make a wish for me. You ready? Yes. Can we sing happy no, birthday? Yes. Okay, well, okay. Ready? Let's go. Happy, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Brand. Happy birthday to you. Little Brent's ready. Little well, Brent wants a piece. Yeah, give him a piece of cake. Oh, Watch it. Small piece. Are you ready for some birthday cake? There it Ciao. is. Ciao. It's not hot, honey. You can eat it. Don't say hot. He'll think it's not hot. hot. See? It's small. It's small in there. It's just little tiny right I was 15. Actually, I was 12. Him and some guys come to the house, and I remember him. And my sister didn't like him. Then when I was 16, my mom was working at the hospital in the kitchen, and John worked there in the supply. And he was talking that he needed a date for the Christmas party and he was separated from his wife then. They were going through a divorce. So my mom said, well, I have a 16-year-old daughter, but you'll have to ask her yourself. And he did, he come over, and he told me later his first thoughts when I answered the door, he was this skinny girl with long, straggly blonde hair. He thought, oh no, what did I get myself into? And then when he picked me up for the date, we did go out on the date to the dinner. Then he kind of dumped me. He really did. I chased him, and he he eventually, I guess, decided that he was going to get rid of me, <laughs> so he married me. 
It'll be 22 years, November 23rd. I have to stop here and pay my bill and cash my check. If I don't pay my bill, Charlie don't talk to me. Is that right? We've never, we've never been where we didn't talk to him. See, we have. We've never been where we haven't talked, so we got that much of it now. Thank you, John. Is that all I get? That's it. I got the big hat. Two weeks, I made 25 bucks after I paid my bill. Yeah, but hell, you'll find out they overpaid. And a nickel. You'll find out they overpaid. Yeah. We just started working, and I wasn't working but two or three days a week, and we were struggling and everything, and I came in and asked Charlie if uh, I could charge some groceries, you know, because I found out that he has accounts like that. And he said, how much you need? I said, oh, probably about $20 worth. So. He said, well, here, let's do this. So he just reached in his pocket and handed me a $20 bill and says, pay me back when you get the chance. And I thought that was pretty neat. He didn't know who I was or nothing, you know. And that was that was kind of great. But that's what small towns are. I mean, the small town I was raised in had a little grocery store like this. And everybody went in every two weeks and paid their bills. You just went in every night or whenever you needed groceries and charged it. It was called McCarty and Martin Grocery Store. It's not there anymore. Had an earthquake in 80 and it, about 90% of my old hometown fell down. <laughs> Start out with a. This is just a, we have a kind of a mixed variety. We have groceries, we have casual clothes, we have work clothes, and we have uh, canned goods, groceries, meats, produce, frozen food. This is our office, such as it is. That's my secretary up there. That's who I am. <laughs> She's been my secretary for a long time. When I came home from the war, she was at the gangplank waiting for me to come home. So we've been working it out together ever since. Levi's, this is what we call blue jeans, hickory shirts. This is what the men, incidentally, we don't grow these here. They come from the South, but we use lots of them. In here, we call this our boot room. And this is kind of a high rent district when you're going to work. We have boots. This boot here is a believe it or not, this is $175 worth of work shoe. It costs almost $300 for a man to buy a proper winter wear just to get ready. Hard hat, wool socks, underwear, blue jeans, shirts, and everything that it takes. And when we can equip a logger from the skin out. But the thing of it is, is it's expensive. But whenever I sell that, that's a big part of my, my day too. So uh, I really, and if you take away my logger, you're taking away my, my sales.
Okay, here's now this is downtown. This is the, the plaza. It isn't very big, it's an awful small little town. But this is what the timber communities are. They're just small towns and families living and working together. I remember that guy there says Filbert the Nut. Most of the truck drivers use handles. When I lived over here, they used to call me the town drunk. Of course, I don't drink, so I don't know how I got stuck with that handle, but, but I did. Over where I work now, they call me scrap iron. Okay? <laughs> it's exciting though. <laughs> and the winner is. <clears throat> yes. Didn't you eat before you got here? No, I never. <laughs> I haven't eaten since 5 30 this morning. No <laughs> doubt in my mind. <laughs> All right. Are you guys ready? The winner is number. Seven. Number seven. Who's number seven? <laughs> no. I can't be possible. Kiwanis class. This used to be a pretty busy place 10, 15 years ago. It was just train loads and lumber and plywood out of here. And the railroad track goes on down to the Willamette Lumber and Hampton Veneers down at the other end of town. And then it used to go on out all the way to Grand Ron with all the mills closed and people are moving off to the other towns and stuff. I didn't come from a wealthy family. Game, and I know very well what happens to a family because it happened to mine when I was in the fifth grade. My dad was 40 years old. He didn't have a high school education. He had five kids and a mortgage, though, and he lost his job. And I remember the day very well when my mom was crying, and I asked her the first time in my life I'd seen my mom cry. And she, I said, what's wrong, Mommy? And she said, the bank's going to take our house away. And I know very well the feelings and what goes on in those families and I will stand with the workers and their families. I never, I never want that to happen to you or your family. And the way we do that is we settle this issue with the timber supply and we go out there, we get the door manufacturing, manufacturing jobs, doors and windows and cabinets, trust joist beams, good paying jobs, not hamburger flipping jobs, but good jobs, timber related jobs into these communities. And I'm going to be standing here with you, timber workers, uh, and all Oregonians, if I'm elected to the Congress. Thank you very much. There's a lot of people that still don't realize the impact of what's going to happen until they lose their job. The other day, one of our drivers, she says, uh, the difference between depression and recession is, recession is when your neighbor loses his job, depression is when you lose yours. I do all of this and then Charlie checks me just to make sure I haven't taken any of his money or that I put it in the wrong place, which I do lots of times. And then it goes to an accountant who is a friend of ours that we've had for 40 years but he lives at the coast, so twice a year we get to go to the coast to the accountant's office to make sure everything's in ready for the government, you know, when we do the government taxes. And this is an old, old-fashioned McCaskey. I told you about this, didn't I? And this has our charge account customers. Well, this looks kind of messy. Well, this is our charge account customers. And everybody that charges here, uh, they pay either every two weeks or once a month or whenever we can catch them. 
you know, it, de it depends on what they're doing. And uh, so this is where we live and eat out of is this thing here. So it works pretty well. Well, when the people, uh, they have financial problem, you know what it means, if they're not working, well, they come to the store and they say, Charlie, will you help me? Well, most of the time I do. If I, there's a way I can, I do. And there's a lot of people, that they don't, then they don't always have to have my help, but there's times that they do when they're raising young families and whatnot. Or if a man needs a new pair of boots before his payday, well, come in, he gets his boots. And then he comes in and pays for them. But, like I say, it, it's a good place to live. And it's a, if you're a good guy, everybody knows it. And if you're a bum, everybody knows it, you know. They're trying to catch a, there's a lady out there in a Acura going down I-5 at 70, passing real close, and they think she, they said they think she's possibly a 31. I think that's the drunk driver at 31. Clear on an 89 Pontiac two-door, current to the last of Scott. Then on Friday and Saturday nights, there's always a family disturbance, or, I don't know, a few weeks ago, there was, Two or three people called in the Salem police and said there was a man dragging a woman down the street by her hair, by the hair of her head. <laughs> you know, I expect that back in the caveman days, but not now. I don't know what he was doing, but that I guess the cops finally caught him or whatever. And then it seems like there's always, you know, every so often there's always a hostage situation or something in, in Salem or Woodburn or Portland or somewhere. I mean, that's, what, that's what makes it look or so nice living out here, is you hear all this and it's always going on someplace else. You know, you don't hear of it here in town very much. spot picked already and Lucky and I and his, his boys all go. So we're gonna leave out Friday sometime. I gotta go pick the camper up. You're not gonna drink any beer, are you? No. <laughs> no, that's, that's one thing I don't do when I go hunting. I don't drink. Some some guys do, that's fine, you know. But I don't drink anyway, you know. I I drink a beer and I get sick, so I stay away from all that stuff. I think it was on a Thursday and I went down for my dentist appointment and um, got out my dentist appointment and didn't have no tickets so I went down to the bank and got me twenty dollars out of the out of the old card thing there and went back up and bought me um, five dollars quick pick and uh, the next Saturday I was out golfing Black Butte and we was all BSing about how it'd be nice to win the lottery and buy us a condo or something on the fairways and stuff. And <laughs> that night when we got home, I seen the numbers flash across the board and, or across the screen and went in the bedroom, got my ticket and came outside and went down there to the first number and started across there. And I said, 
god damn that sure looks like you know all my numbers so i call up my mom she always writes down the numbers and she told me the numbers and sure enough i had all six of them <laughs> that was the beginning of the end <laughs> you still bum cigarettes in copenhagen yeah. they told me not to change so i decided to say the same <laughs> how much did you win it was uh, 1,666,680. Oh, my yeah, first year we went back to uh, Florida and went to Disney World and Epcot Center and, and we went on a cruise out in the Bahamas and messed around out in the Bahamas for four or five days and played the casinos and stuff like that. And just generally had fun. First vacation in 20 years. It's the feeling of being unsecure, you know, not knowing whether you're going to have your job, how long you're going to have it, and uh, or how much, even if you got your job, how much you're going to get to work and, and make a living. It'd be nice. I like to, you know, like people always want to win the lottery, win millions of dollars. I'd like to just win like something like maybe like $50,000. I could pay my house off, all my cars. You know, I wouldn't owe nobody nothing. I, and have probably... I don't know, twenty-five thousand dollars left over. Then, then still keep my job because I don't think I'd ever want to just completely quit and just start going around. I think I'd get nervous. I can't, can't imagine having to try to spend millions of dollars because uh, we've never really had anything. You know, my family wasn't very rich, and Robin's family wasn't. We, all of them have been just common people that work for a living. You know. All I need is $10,000 just to get me out of the hole that we're in. No, well, not even that. 5000 would just bring me up to date, current on everything. And if I could start over. When we first moved into the house, I had very little to work with, and I did very well. Then John started making a little bit more money, and we spent to that. Now we're, he's back to be at, you know, making less, and it's just, the bills are there for the more. Do you worry about the future? No. I worry about my children's futures, not mine. Because I'm sure, I know my oldest would take care of me, so I don't have to worry about mine. It's just, if they don't have a future, then I'm not going to have a future. I've been in Mill City for 20 years. I guess I'm third generation Oregonian, fourth generation from the timber industry. And I was involved in the timber industry for about 12 years. And now I um, have a flying service and a computer business that were timber dependent, which almost are bankrupt right now because the timber industry won't use me. I've been going broke being a conservationist, but uh, it's something that um, needed to be done. Yeah, because if we can put some two by six right up there and just cross brace like you have there, that'll uh, sturdy it up when we take this out. The tail will fit in underneath there. You back it in, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I became a pariah in my own community. Um, people wouldn't talk to me. I went to which, watch my um, boys play football, and uh, I'd have a whole bench to myself. Nobody was, everybody was afraid to even stand next to me or sit next to me. Um, and my friends were afraid to come over because they thought that uh, associating with me would taint them 
And so if they did come over, they'd hide their car in my hangar. Um, they'd call me up on the phone. Um, but they were afraid that they'd come up and they'd stand to you next to you in the grocery store and, and, and tell you they really believed what you were saying was correct or true and, and that they admire your courage for doing it at the same time they were never they would they couldn't do it themselves they couldn't stand up and, and do it themselves they're afraid for their jobs they're afraid for how the community would look at them and then it got worse than that um, being socially ostracized I mean it's not it's not fun it's not, it wasn't fun for me or my family but um, then it got to the point where they were they were death threats there was threats against me there's threats against my family um, ran my son off the road in the logging truck a couple times. They um, held my daughter down in school and tied yellow ribbons around her, which are the symbol of the timber industry. Mainly hearsay. I didn't didn't know the person or his wife, but I talked to some of the loggers that knew the guy. They weren't out in the woods. They were up by the, the crummy and stuff. And I guess this tree fell over and hit an old snag, and the snag just blew apart. Well, when it did, a big chunk of of a, the log came over and hit him, and then killed him instantly, from what I heard. And then these environmental people had the nerve to send letters to his wife saying that if he hadn't have been out there, you know, raping the forest and, and just cutting the trees down and absolutely ruining everything, that he wouldn't have got killed. And it was just a job. He was out there making a job for his family. It was something he liked to do, and it was a way of making a living. And I thought, boy, then now that's, to me, that's terrorism, you know. You're talking about the corporation. Do they have our interest in mind? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah, it seems like they have the most power. They do the most damage. And I don't think they have the communities in, I don't think they're thinking about the communities at all. I don't think they give a shit about the communities. Okay, let's Excuse say me. that that's there true. Is there is life. Life. Do you work? And they're selling like off. I work. What do you do for a living? I cook in a tofu factory. But do the majority of you guys work? Put in a lot of taxpayer money? I put taxpayer money in. So do I. I'm a tax-paying citizen. My tax dollars go to the forces. It's so part the of the, yes. the way America well, works. There's five percent left. There's five percent of the forest left. Well, I have a lot of forest over his green. When I see, I mean, the what biggest about the stuff that's already set aside. They're not cutting it all down. That but that's aside. so small. I mean, ninety-five percent of the classroom people they are behave themselves. This is life and death. It's not a garden for you to come in for people. I don't care whether they're. I don't care who to harvest you, you flowers from. Yeah, money is part of America. Money is part and it's of none of our business. We can do fine. We just better take care of our water. We better take care of our air. You better make sure you don't poison all our fruit. You know, we better not get in a war. But for God's sakes, as far as the earth is concerned, let's preserve the last bit of the ancient stuff that's so rare that we've taken advantage of so much. Well, I try to keep my sense of humor through the death threats, and so on my answering machine, I, uh, I had a message for a while. It said, hi, this is George, and please leave your name and number. But if this is a death threat, um, why don't you relax, take a deep breath, think about what you're gonna say. You're probably nervous unless you've done this before, and then leave your death threat, and don't forget to leave your name, your telephone number, and your address. I will be back to you. Of course, none of them ever did that, but I still got the death threats. There's three links on here. That's the emblem of our order. That's friendship, love, and truth, which is what our order's based on, is 
we're supposed to always exhibit friendship, love, and truth. <laughs> this flight fence and so uh, my territory goes to Niagara clear down beyond Fisherman's Bend Park and I report all deer kill on Highway 22 oh, in that see. section. Well this year I had an elk kill to report. My word. Uh, a nice big uh, yearling uh, elk bull uh, right down in front of my place. What did it hit or what hit it? I think a truck. Okie dokie. Well, I didn't let Terry go by and he was right by the two, so we got another. Keep on coming. There's another white one right here. I'm at the two. Okay, come on around. Okay. Hey, I know you guys are hurrying so you can go down and have some lunch. I know, and I got to go back to work. Won't get to eat for three or four more hours. <laughs> All right, I get up there to the top at the four-way tunnel. I'll throw down some french fries for you. Okay, well, I'm hoping that big elk will still be up there. I'm going to get out there with my knife and uh, just cut me a slab off of him and cook it. That's, that worked real good. So if you see an elk tomorrow I'll run around with a limp, you know I got him. <laughs> okay. People who've prided themselves on being self, so self-reliant are no longer self-reliant. In fact, uh, because the times are changing around them, they're whining and whimpering and crying and acting like a bunch of damn babies as far as I'm concerned. And uh, I've told them that it's about time you people pick yourself up by your own bootstraps and see and prove who you really are uh, and recognize that the world's changed around you and you've cut yourself out of a job and now we have to adapt and do something else. I don't want to see all the trees cut down. You'll never see them all cut down, but uh, some of the stuff we're replanting now, if they would just allow us to go in and take out some of the old stuff and then let some of the stuff we're replanting grow in 200 years from now, it's going to be old growth. And it's going to be a lot better than what the old growth is standing now. Nothing ever lives forever, you know. Everything changes. The people to blame for it people that are responsible for this are not the people in Mill City. It's not even the uh, mill owners or the logging company owners. They push the politicians to cut the, the forest as fast as possible. But the politicians were, and we're talking about the Oregon delegation, our congressmen, they are the stewards or the trustees of the trust, the federal trust. And they ripped it off. They ripped it off and they sold it cheap in order to further their own political careers. And to me, it's criminal. This is what you call the gob and daub method. You, you see a hole, you do it like that. <laughs> Get a gob of paint on it, and then you just kind of daub it in the hole. Go to stores, get a paintbrush, charge it to the Wilsons. Charge it to the Wilsons. They'll know if you go in with a the paintbrush, they'll know what you're doing there for. John and I used to never get help from any of the people we knew. I can't say they were friends then because they never helped. We were there for them, but here with 
the puckets, they're friends. Well, family. Yes, you could just say we're one big family now. They're there for us, and we're there for them. Lynn did make a, a good I don't know what the comment or for. statement or whatever. She says, how many there. hunting trips are you behind? He's been real before. <laughs> you know how many times has he left me, and I've stayed at home. Gonna... Well, lucky he got his deer. I was glad because I said, good, now he's done this year. So he goes and buys a bird tag so he can go up be with the boys anyway. <laughs> well, Which is alright, then I get the house to myself. I, yeah, th that's what I don't understand. These women think that they've got to, one thing is to be uh, equal to the man. And I think it's so nice when they leave and go off hunting and you've got the house, you can clean things or not clean. I mean, you can get caught up on things that you... I took the behind. I got Stuart's through the whole deer this year. Cut it up and everything. It looks so much better. It looks bigger. It makes the house look newer. That brown was really awful. I can't say what I really feel about that brown. <laughs> what would your ideal house be? Elegant. Uh, two story. Four bedroom. A kitchen that I can work in and I mean it doesn't look dirty when it's clean. And I don't have to worry when the kids turn the water on in the sink, it doesn't run down the counter onto the floor. Make a mess. Comfortable. I want an elegant, formal living room, just small, my room. But I want a huge family room for my friends and my family. No carpet, so if we spill anything on it, it just mop it up. But I'll have the family room before the living room because that's more important than family. Yeah, let the court look here at you. Yeah. Oh, it looks like he was about to. Do you want some help? No, I think I get this. You'll get the scale. Okay. We've done it enough, I guess we can do <laughs> one this. More, one more round. Steaks and chops and burger. Your special recipe. That's. Holy you won't have any problems. It's heavy. Though. You want some beef suet, please? Yes. Pound and a half, I guess, of burger. Steak. Let's see. Back stock, loin steak, ground steak, and grind, right? Right. Okay. I think I have your order, Tom. All right. We'll do you a good job. You bet. Yeah. You always have. Okay. We got her. <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Uh -huh. There you go, Buck. I was raised in a family where we raised on a ranch. The first chicken, the first calf, and the first egg, and the first beef went on our table. What we had surplus is what we sold. But we took care of our table first. And I think America should take care of its table first. There are two points of view, those that come to look and those that come to live. And I'll admit, whenever we log, it, it does get cut up a little bit, but it grows back. In other words, these people want us to stop manufacturing lumber and, and, and growing and, and stand and look. Well, there's just so long you can look at a beautiful scene until you suddenly you have to have lunch. And, and that seems to get important too. But I think we can have the beautiful scenery. I think we can have the lunch. I think we can have the house, and that's what I call the American dream. All right, can I take your order? Yeah, I'd like to have a chicken sandwich in a basket and a fish sandwich in a basket. Coffee. Okay, would you like anything to drink? Yeah, two coffees. Decaf. Okay, we have two for hair and A B for hair. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I don't know. I think that I'd want people to think I'd want the world to be right, but no, I just like to have my own world right, just mine. I guess that's a little selfish, but we've struggled. John and I have struggled, and I just feel like me and my family. I'm not too concerned with the rest of the world. It's right now, this is my world.
take it away and I have nothing. And that's what's going to happen if the, they stop logging. My husband will have to find another line of work, which he can. He drives truck. doesn't matter what's in that trailer. He can get that product, whatever it is, someplace. And he's done it. It's just I don't want to have to move someplace else, and that's we would have to. Or he would be long hauling, and that's all over the United States. And I could stay here with the, the family, but I don't want him gone for 10 days, two weeks. He's done it, and I don't like it. cutting in the National Forest about 25 years, 20, 25 years. And uh, when you look at it from that perspective and how much is gone, it doesn't look like there's very much left, whether we can keep this going. When people say this will last another 10 years, I don't believe it. I think it'll maybe last five or seven years at the max. See, there's nothing real fresh right through here. But up here a little bit further, you can see a lot of real fresh tracks and stuff where they've been through. See, Aaron got that big old four point buck just right over there. Where? Right up there by that timber. Yeah, now isn't that the knob you're talking about? Yeah, that's the knob. That's normally where we go down on the bottom on this side, Lance goes, right? Yeah. And him and I sit on that road. Uh -huh. And then you guys go around the back side and come down through that timber and then down through that real brushy stuff. Yeah, I kicked two bucks out there. Two guys last year and they got them. Look at that. That's a visual that you that speaks for itself. That is a true visual. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. yeah. The marijuana signs and. Yeah. Trying to arrest me, you better have some really good legal information. And what legal boundary does this power line represent? I'm not here to debate that. I'm not. This isn't a debate. This is a legal question. It's a very direct question. We're not going to say you're wrong. I'd like to understand under what authority you're threatening to arrest me. Uh, that is, this area is closed for today. What area? <laughs> this area, that's right. But the power line, is this a power they line? They don't want us up there destroying their marijuana fields. Are they doing? They're going to go, and the, they're going to go to that place. They're going to go around. I'm going, to, I'm going to go hiking into the National Forest because the National Forests are open to us and that's where I'm going to okay. Operations, Penrose. Flying over Warehouser Land now. It's uh, one of the biggest tree harvesting companies in the uh, Pacific Northwest. They call themselves the Tree Growing Company. As you can see, that they've decimated this entire valley. And this is what's going to happen in the National Forest if we don't stop. It's uh, National Forest is not far behind. They're doing the same thing in the National Forest what they did in the private lands. They're going to cut it off. You see where he's at? Oh, I can't see him. But you see his ass. And there he is. God damn it. Is it a doe? I can't see any antlers on him. That's a 
still. I couldn't see any antlers on it. I was about ready to squeeze off the shot too. Get your hands off my property. Unless you're willing to arrest me to take your hands off my property. Let's go out here and talk about it. We can talk about it here, can we? Why can't we talk about it here? Well, I'm, I think nice I want to hike along the highway here. Okay, you go ahead and go along the highway over there. <laughs> you know, what? what? I'm asking you to please stay out of the I'm yeah. not in the compound. I'm just hiking down the highway. I said I'm hiking down the highway. Then get out on the highway and out of this there's area. It's dangerous on the highway. There's there's okay. cars there. I can get hit. I want to go in the woods. The national forests are open to the public, and I want to enjoy the national forest. I'm trying to enjoy the Be careful. Here. Don't oh. hurt yourself. Well, if you keep. Oh, do you mean that? Yeah, I do. I heard it was across the street. Hold on, why, this was why is this low called the low blow timber, timber sale? sale? And they told us wow. it was across the street. I heard it was across the street, and it's not. It's right here next to the Detroit Ranger Station. I don't think they know exactly what you're talking about. This sign faces the clear cut unit. Low blow. You don't have to believe the uh, timber industry. Basically, if you get in an airplane and you see what's going on, then you can make up your own mind how what the real problem is. As far as I'm concerned, the real problem is not the spotted owl, it's not the preservationist or the environmentalist, it's the fact that we've cut the entire forest. We're not up against the owl, we're up against the Pacific Ocean. And that's where the problem lies. Is that this problem that's facing Mill City and everybody else in, this, in Oregon right now is something that's a result of really bad management over the years, letting politicians manage the national forest. And now we're faced with paying the, the price, the day of reckoning. The politicians won't pay it, the people of Mill City will pay it, and the people who care about this and the environment and the ecosystem that's here, they're also going to pay it. Times, I think it's ones that want to take over. And that's what probably will eventually happen, is that the majority of the people, the little people, like me, not that I'm going to do it, but we're going to get so angry at our judges and higher ups that we're going to go in and we're going to fight them. We're going to, it's going to be mass murders of, of officials. I just had this, I just, this is what's going to happen. People are going to get so angry that everything's being taken from them. And it's not, it's not going to be whites or blacks. It's everybody. They're all going together, together, and they're going to just go in and I don't know if they'll, I, I imagine they're going to slaughter the judges and I don't know about the president. Maybe he'll be there. You know, I think it'd only be fair that if we have to go back to living and giving up all of this country, that to them that uh, we ought to go back to the same laws and the same way of living that we did in 1850, and then deal with them. It'd be fun. <laughs> Frontier Justice. Yeah, basically. They have gone so far as to advertise in the Earth First News that uh, if you have AIDS, cancer, an incurable disease, they'll furnish you with a backpack full of explosives. And their suggestion is to go out as a martyr, take a dam with you, or take a bridge with you. Yeah, this is the fun part. We'd like to just move up here, live up here, just like this. That's fine with us. Environmentalists want to go back to the olden days. We'll go back to the olden days. Just give us a little pot of ground up here somewhere and some horses and a couple of mules or something. <coughs> 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 
<clears throat> I don't know about you guys, but that fire is getting hot. I backed off. He You're told me where the compound was, I backed off. You told me Take where it. the compound Ma was, I backed off. You're on the compound. Oh, okay. You're telling me the legal boundary? I told you you were on the compound. How far you want to go? I'm behind that wood right there. Sure? Sure. Sure. I wanted to travel. I just thought it would be so nice to just go and never stop when I was little. But I don't now. I've done too many moves from California to Oregon. I've done it twice. I don't care to go very far very <laughs> much anymore. Even if the timber goes, I don't think I will sell my house here. I will keep it as long as I can and live here as long as I can, even if that means John going out on the road again. I will stay here. I'm gonna buy some wood Every size and length I'm gonna build it good Using all my strength Gonna clear the land Where the house will be And start another branch Of the family tree Gonna chalk a line And lay a walnut floor Build the walls of pine And hang a cherry door I'll cut the beams above from mahogany and I'll get the love from the family tree I've wandered far and I've walked alone till the morning star 